This video is made possible by Nebula. Use the link down in the description below to support Real Life Lore directly by signing up, where you can watch dozens of additional and exclusive full-length videos in my ongoing Nebula Modern Conflict series that covers recent major wars and crises, including this video's next part, covering the entire history of the Lebanon Civil War and the previous 2006 Israel-Hezbollah War, which will provide vital context that is very important to understanding the current conflict going on today. On October 7th, 2023, Hamas and other Palestinian militant groups within the Gaza Strip launched a devastating surprise attack on Israel that killed more than 1,200 Israelis and took more than 200 more as hostages. In the aftermath of that attack, Israel issued a formal declaration of war against Hamas, mobilized more than 300,000 soldiers from their reserves, ordered the evacuation of all Israeli civilians from around the Gaza Strip, and initiated a complete land, sea, and air blockade of the Gaza Strip itself that has restricted food, fuel, water, and medical supplies from getting in. From there, the war has been carried out in a series of phases from the Israeli perspective. In the first phase, the Israeli Air Force initiated a punishing three-week-long aerial bombing campaign across the entire Gaza Strip, with the stated aims of destroying Hamas's infrastructure and giving Israel's own troops enough time to assemble and prepare for the upcoming ground invasion that was aimed at toppling Hamas's government in the Gaza Strip. Israel then ordered that the entire population in the northern section of the Gaza Strip be evacuated. And then, on October 27th, the Israeli began the second phase of the war, a full-scale ground invasion into the northern Gaza Strip that they had ordered to be evacuated. Their strategy was to use the invasion to slice the Gaza Strip into two, push as many Palestinian civilians as possible towards the south, and attack isolated Hamas forces encircled in the north. As of this video's production, this second phase of Israel's war is beginning to wrap up, with Israeli military control largely secured across most of the northern Gaza Strip, and Gaza City itself rendered to a shattered ghost town. And already, the consequences for the Palestinians within the Gaza Strip have been absolutely catastrophic. The Hamas-run Gazan Health Ministry has reported that more than 14,000 Palestinians within the Gaza Strip have died since the war began, a statistic that represents the deaths of more than one in every 200 people who had lived there. And among those deaths include at least 5,500 children, a fact that makes the current conflict the deadliest war for children that has been fought in modern history. Around 1.5 million Palestinians, or about 70% of the Gaza Strip's population, have been internally displaced from their homes amidst the heavy fighting in the north of the Strip, and they have nearly all been pushed together into the southern end of the Strip, an area that was already, even before the war, one of the most densely populated places on the planet, and which is now arguably the single most densely packed place in the entire world, as they have nowhere else to go beyond Israel and Egypt's blockade and the Mediterranean Sea. And now, with the northern Gaza Strip largely secured by the Israeli military, Israel is contemplating when to initiate their third phase of the war, expanding the ground invasion towards the southern Gaza Strip and securing total control over the entire area. But this next phase will be fraught with incredible dangers. Hamas is believed to operate a vast and complex network of tunnels, hundreds of kilometers long beneath the entire Gaza Strip, a system that has sometimes been referred to as the Gaza Metro. Hamas's chief political leader still residing in the Gaza Strip, Yahya Sinwar, is believed to currently be hiding somewhere in these tunnels beneath his hometown of Khan Yunus in the southern Gaza Strip, along with a significant number of the hostages that were seized on October 7th. And so, in order to fully destroy Hamas and rescue all of their hostages, the two primary stated war aims of the Israelis, they will have to eventually invade the southern Gaza Strip too and do something about all of the tunnels. But doing so in this extremely crowded urban environment is almost certainly going to get extremely ugly and result in even higher Palestinian civilian casualties than even before as well. And when they invade the southern Gaza Strip, Israel will also become very vulnerable on other fronts. And there are already troubling signs emerging that the war could end up rapidly escalating away from immediately around Gaza and towards a greater, cataclysmic Middle Eastern wide war. In many cases, the geopolitical pieces have already been put into place to fight one. Let's begin by visiting the country that is immediately to the west of the Gaza Strip, Egypt. So far, Egypt has continued keeping their side of the border with the Gaza Strip sealed during Israel's invasion, and has largely refused to allow the vast majority of people across it. If this situation continues to persist by the time Israel expands their invasion into the southern Gaza Strip, then millions of Palestinian civilians will effectively have nowhere to go, caught between the Israeli army, the sealed Egyptian border, and the Mediterranean Sea. 
There has been rampant speculation about what Israel's ultimate intentions are for the more than 2 million Palestinians who will become trapped in this scenario. A paper published a week after Hamas's attack on the 13th of October by a department within Israel's intelligence ministry recommended that the entire civilian population of Gaza, some 2 million people, be evacuated across the border into Egypt's Sinai Peninsula. Shortly afterwards, the paper was leaked to the public, and the Israeli government was quick to insist that the paper has no actual basis or influence on official policy. Nonetheless, Israeli diplomats have apparently privately proposed a similar idea to multiple governments to transfer at least several hundred thousand Palestinians into the Sinai as the war in the Gaza Strip continues. But Egypt's government, led by Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, meanwhile, has resoundingly rejected that this will ever happen. The Sinai Peninsula itself is largely an uninhabitable desert and is very sparsely populated with only 600,000 Egyptian residents, compared to 2.2 million Palestinians who live in the Gaza Strip. Relocating all of them into the Sinai would result in more than a four-fold increase in the peninsula's population, and Egypt simply doesn't have the resources or the infrastructure in place to accommodate that many people there all at once. Egypt was already teetering on the economic brink even before this new crisis started. With a debt-to-GDP ratio that has ballooned to nearly 93%, as the country continues to spend lavishly on constructing its brand new capital city just to the east of Cairo. Accepting millions of refugees in an underdeveloped part of the country, then, could obviously strain the country's troubled finances even further. Moreover, El Sisi's government in Egypt is also staunchly opposed to Hamas as an organization. After all, Hamas was originally founded as the Palestinian offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood Organization, an Islamist organization that has its roots in Egypt, and the organization that found its way to power in Egypt briefly between 2012 and 2013, before El Sisi and the Egyptian military overthrew them during a coup d'etat. Ever since then, El Sisi outlawed the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, and has been struggling to contain an armed Islamist insurgency opposed to his rule that has been thriving in the geographically remote and rugged interior of the Sinai Peninsula. The various Islamist insurgents operating within the Sinai Peninsula have been able to smuggle weapons and militants back and forth with their fellow Islamists who rule in the Gaza Strip, Hamas. Which is why El Sisi's Egypt has been so enthusiastic about maintaining their side of the blockade of Gaza. More than 3,000 Egyptian soldiers have died fighting against the insurgency in the Sinai ever since it began in 2011. And now, one of El Sisi's most pressing fears is that if millions of Palestinians evacuate from the Gaza Strip into the Sinai, there may be hundreds or even thousands of Hamas militants traveling among them who could greatly exacerbate the Sinai insurgency all over again. Moreover, Palestinians forced out from their homes in Gaza may decide to attack Israel in the future from Egyptian territory within the Sinai, which has the potential to directly bring Egypt into conflict with Israel in the future. El Sisi himself has expressed his concerns that any allegedly temporary evacuation of Palestinians from Gaza into the Sinai could easily transform into a permanent resettlement after the fact, which would symbolize the final liquidation of the Palestinian cause in Gaza once and for all. There have been some discussions made about Israel and or the United States agreeing to pay off significant amounts of Egypt's government debt, in exchange for Egypt allowing large numbers of Palestinians to resettle in the Sinai. But accepting such a deal would almost certainly prove to be the political suicide for El Sisi, as he would appear towards the rest of the Arab and Islamic worlds in addition to his own people as the man who agreed to be bribed to look the other way as the final hope of an independent Palestinian state in Gaza was extinguished. And for all of those reasons, it is doubtful that Egypt will ever voluntarily open up their borders completely to all of the Palestinians within the Gaza Strip, and where so many of them will end up going when or if Israel invades the southern Gaza Strip is anybody's best guess. Meanwhile, in the Israeli-occupied West Bank, the situation is similarly growing increasingly unstable. The Israeli army has withdrawn substantial numbers of their troops from the West Bank and redeployed them to the more pressing theaters in Gaza and the northern border with Lebanon, which has given the Israeli settler militias within the West Bank more influence to do what they please. According to the United Nations figures, daily attacks from Israeli settlers on Palestinians within Area C of the West Bank have more than doubled since Hamas's attack on Israel that came on October 7th. While 2023 is looking like it will end as one of the bloodiest years on record for Palestinians within the West Bank. The hardline Israeli settlers in the West Bank who want to annex parts or all of Area C directly into Israel likely realize that their window of opportunity could be closing in the near future. 
As the Israeli war against Hamas in Gaza continues, the Israeli government will almost certainly face increasing pressures from abroad to restart a new diplomatic process with the Palestinians on the two-state solution. And the Palestinians and much of the rest of the world will want the Palestinian state to include the entirety of the West Bank, including Area C, where 480,000 Israeli settlers currently live. Most of the plans that are being discussed right now concerning the future of the Gaza Strip after Israel dismantles Hamas's government there involve giving control of the post-war Gaza Strip back to the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian government that currently only controls the enclaves of areas A and B in the West Bank, and the government led by the 88-year-old Mahmoud Abbas and his Fatah party that lost control over the Gaza Strip back in 2007 after Hamas ejected them. However, in exchange for accepting the return control and responsibility over the Gaza Strip following the war, it is expected that Abbas and the Palestinian Authority are likely to demand that they will also need ironclad assurances from the United States for a clear and final path towards an independent Palestinian state based on the entirety of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and probably East Jerusalem as well. And if Washington agrees, that implies that the roughly 700,000 Israeli settlers who live in the West Bank and East Jerusalem together would have to be mass evacuated into Israel proper. And thus, with a large amount of the Israeli military now moved out of the West Bank to focus on all the other fronts, the Israeli settlers and militias in Area C are sensing that in order to keep their colonies within Israel in the future, they must act now before a ceasefire or peace agreement is made that might surrender Area C for good. From their perspective, perhaps, by forcibly pushing as many Palestinians as they can from Area C into the enclaves of Areas A and B or into neighboring Jordan. And if the violence in the West Bank between the settlers and the Palestinians continues to escalate amidst the ongoing war in Gaza, it might eventually become enough to trigger a third intifada or uprising from among the three million Palestinians who live across the entire West Bank. An uprising that would likely involve attacks on Israeli settlements in Area C and attacks across the West Bank into Israel proper. A full-blown Palestinian insurgency exploding in the West Bank like this before the war in Gaza is even finished would likely force the Israelis to redeploy some of their forces away from Gaza and back towards the West Bank to suppress it. Because if the uprising got more radical, it would trigger one of Israel's greatest geographic fears. Ever since Israel's founding in 1948, the country has been very wary of any hostile power acquiring control over the West Bank. Because it includes a series of highly elevated hills that overlook Israel's lower elevation and narrow coastal plain. While Israel's self-declared capital and most well-known city is Jerusalem, Israel's actual civilizational core is located here across the narrow and low coastal plain between the Mediterranean Sea and the hills of the West Bank. This narrow coastal plain includes the Tel Aviv metropolitan area right here, which is a region that is also known in Hebrew as Gush Dan. Gush Dan is home to more than 4,150,000 people today, which is about 44% of the entire Israeli population all on its own. Gush Dan further represents roughly half of the entire Israeli economy. And so, despite Jerusalem being the country's political and religious capital, Tel Aviv is the country's economic, commercial, cultural, and industrial core. And tragically, for the fates of millions of people throughout history, Israel's narrowest geographic point is also just to the north of the Gush Dan region here, in between the West Bank and the Mediterranean Sea. This gap is less than nine miles wide. And so, if the West Bank was fully under the control of an organization that was hostile to Israel, such as Hamas, it would only take an advance of about nine miles for an invasion force to completely sever Israel into two separate geographic halves. And for reference, during the October 7th attack, Hamas was able to punch into Israel nearly 14 miles deep at their furthest advance. Had the same thing happened out of the West Bank, Israel could have been split into two, while militants could have been attacking the downtown core of Tel Aviv itself. And so, in order to increase their strategic depth further away from the coastal plain, and in order to deny an enemy the use of the high ground immediately facing the coastal plain, Israel has long considered their continued control, or at least influence over the West Bank, to be a geographically vital strategy to maintain even if the rest of the outside world considers it to be illegal and condemns them for it. Which is Israel's strategic rationale for having allowed hundreds of thousands of settlers to live in the West Bank, and why Israel would immediately respond to a large-scale Palestinian insurgency erupting in the West Bank that could potentially catapult a new, more hostile government into areas A and B there. 
Such an event taking place would also be a terrifying prospect for the neighboring Hashemite kingdom of Jordan to witness as well. Because of previous history, Jordan is already the home of the largest number of Palestinian refugees and their descendants anywhere in the world, nearly 2.2 million of them. These Palestinian refugees already make up about 20% of the kingdom's entire population, and they aren't even the only refugees present here either. Jordan is also home to nearly 800,000 more refugees from Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and Sudan bringing the total number of refugees present within the country today to around 3 million, out of a total population of only 11.4 million. This means that Jordan already has the second highest number of refugees per capita of any country in the world. And that means they are looking at the situation in the neighboring West Bank and the Gaza Strip with a very high degree of alarm. As Israel has already ordered more than 1 million Palestinians to evacuate from the northern Gaza Strip, and speculation runs rampant about more potentially being evacuated into Egypt's Sinai Peninsula, Jordan's principal fear right now is that if the situation worsens in the West Bank as well, up to 3 million of the Palestinians who live there might be pushed out into Jordan. And if that happens, the country would shatter. With so many refugees already present in the country, a sudden large influx of even more would strain Jordan's resources to the breaking point, which would be a similarly terrifying prospect to Saudi Arabia as well. Since dramatically increased instability in Jordan, from millions of Palestinian refugees fleeing or being pushed into both of them, would directly threaten one of the Saudi Kingdom's most ambitious mega-projects going on right nearby. Neo the $500 billion futuristic linear city that they are building immediately adjacent to Jordan and the Sinai Peninsula. Jordan and Saudi Arabia have therefore each made it extremely clear that any expulsion of Palestinians from the West Bank into Jordan will be a very firm red line for Israel not to cross, that could even jeopardize the previously agreed upon peace treaties between Israel and Egypt and Jordan. And then, looming all around Israel, circling like sharks sniffing for blood, are Iran and their allied proxy forces that they call the Axis of Resistance, consisting of the king, Iran itself, their Rook, the Houthis in control of northwestern Yemen, their Knights, the Shiite militias in Iraq and Syria, their Bishop, the Bashar al-Assad regime in Syria, their Queen, Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, and their various pawns, the many Palestinian militant groups operating within the Gaza Strip all of whom cooperate together with Iran in pursuit of a common ultimate objective, the complete annihilation of Israel as a state. Of all the pieces on the board that are in this axis of resistance, it is Iran's Rook, the Houthis, who are the ones that are the most geographically far removed from the current fight going on between Israel and Hamas. Their territory is about 1,600 kilometers away from Israel's and separated by the entirety of Saudi Arabia and nearly the entire length of the Red Sea. But, nonetheless, distance has not dissuaded the Houthis from attempting to join in the fight anyway, and they're already using their geographic advantages to harm Israel in other ways. Armed with advanced long-range cruise missiles, surface-to-air missiles, and suicide drones supplied from the Iranians, the Houthis possess substantially more capable weapons than Hamas does, with the ranges required to attack Israel itself. And so, they've been frequently using them ever since Israel began its invasion of the Gaza Strip to target Israel's southernmost city, Eilat, which is also Israel's only maritime port beyond the Mediterranean that's on the Red Sea. So far, all of the missiles and drones that the Houthis have fired towards Eilat have been either intercepted by American or Israeli warships operating within the Red Sea, intercepted by Israeli or Saudi anti-air defenses, or have crashed off target without causing any casualties. But the Houthis are only likely to continue firing more and more the longer that the war in Gaza continues. While the Houthis are beginning to escalate their side of the war much further in other ways, too. On the 19th of November, a cargo ship called the Galaxy Leader that was traveling through the Red Sea on its way to India was spectacularly hijacked by a group of armed and well-trained Houthi militants, who raided the ship with a helicopter and then brought it, along with the ship's entire crew, back to one of their own controlled ports in Yemen as hostages. This hijacking took place shortly after the Houthi spokesperson declared that their intention going forward would be to target any ship owned or operated by Israeli companies or flying the Israeli flag that they catch traveling in the Red Sea or through the Bab al-Mandeb Strait. The Galaxy leadership that they hijacked on November 19th wasn't crewed by any Israelis, but apparently did have some ownership ties to an Israeli business tycoon. 
Going forward, the Houthis are likely to continue targeting Israel's ability to conduct trade with Asia through the Suez Canal by attempting further maritime piracy and hijackings around the narrow Bab el-Mandeb Strait that they control most of the eastern shore of, and by continuing to fire missiles and drones at the southern Israeli port of Eilat. From the Houthis' perspective, the aim of these attacks will be to restrict Israel's maritime trade in the Red Sea and through the Suez Canal as much as possible, and limit Israel's ability to conduct maritime trade to only their west coast on the shores of the Mediterranean. And while Israel hasn't retaliated against the Houthis yet, it might be forced to if the war in Gaza continues dragging on and the Houthi attacks on them continue escalating. Meanwhile, officials in the United States are already mulling about what to do about the fate of the hostages taken by the Houthis, and what to do if Houthi piracy in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden continues further. The prospect of the Houthis running amok with piracy in the region right now is a terrifying prospect for Washington to consider, because it stands to jeopardize their much-lauded India-Middle-East-Europe economic corridor. A proposal that was announced by the governments of the United States, India, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and the European Union back in September of 2023 during the G20 summit only a month before Hamas's attack on Israel happened. The plan, as it was originally envisioned, was to construct more shipping and rail networks between the loosely aligned governments of India, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Israel, and the European Union. A goal that would greatly benefit the United States as well, because it would also happen to counter China's Belt and Road Initiative ambitions in the region. And, more importantly, it would directly counter Russia's proposed north-south transport corridor between themselves, Azerbaijan, Iran, and India. Washington would rather keep India within their economic orbit than Iran's and Russia's. But with the war erupting between Israel and Hamas in Gaza, the strained relations that it's caused between Israel and the Saudis, Jordanians, and Emiratis, the fear of escalation in the West Bank and elsewhere, and the specter of continued Houthi piracy in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, and continued missile attacks on Israel, the future of the India-Middle East-Europe economic corridor is now uncertain. And in order to defend it, the U.S. Navy will be likely to come down hard on Houthi piracy in the region in the future. The former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, James Stavridis, even further suggested on the 22nd of November that it be made painfully clear to Iran that if they continue supporting Houthi piracy in the region, American maritime operations could equally threaten Iran's own critical offshore oil and gas platforms that are in the Persian Gulf and their own shipping lanes through the narrow Strait of Hormuz. And hence, why one of the American carrier strike groups has relocated from the eastern Mediterranean near Israel to move immediately adjacent to the Strait of Hormuz off Iran's southern coast. The Houthis made a move on the board, the United States responded with a move on their own, and more may follow. Moving to the north, there is Iran's bishop, the Bashar al-Assad regime in Syria. The Syrian government is the most militantly opposed to Israel's existence that remains in the Arab world, and they've continually remained officially at war with Israel ever since Israel's declaration of independence back in 1948. Their armies have clashed multiple times all throughout history, and ever since 1967, Israel has occupied the strategic plateau of the Golan Heights, a geographic area of high ground looking directly into the lower elevated areas of northern Israel proper, than most of the world recognizes as Israeli-occupied territory of Syria. Syria has continued to maintain its own claim to the Golan Heights ever since they lost it in 1967. But despite that, and despite their continued official state of war with Israel, the Assad regime in Syria is in no possible place to do anything against Israel right now during the war in Gaza, because of their own continuing brutal civil war. Ever since 2012, when the fires of all-out civil war first erupted in Syria, more than 600,000 people in the country have been killed, while more than 6.5 million more people have fled the country, likely making it the single deadliest war ever fought entirely in the 21st century. In order to stay in power for all these years, the Assad regime has expended absolutely enormous amounts of both resources and lives. And it still isn't over either. The Assad regime continues to only control about 63% of Syria's internationally recognized territory, with significant other sections under the control of Kurdish militias in the northeast, the Turkish Armed Forces occupation of strips in the north, a pocket of Sunni Islamists in the northwest, continued pockets of ISIS forces in the interior, an American occupation in the south, and the Israeli occupation of the Golan Heights. Assad Syria still has a lot on their plate left to deal with, especially as one of their biggest supporters, the Russians have largely pulled most of their military assets out of the country and threw them into their own ongoing invasion of Ukraine and Europe. 
The civil war in Syria has largely entered into a stalemate by this point, and has become a fairly low-level conflict that's absent of any heavy fighting. Bashar al-Assad's grip over the territory that he does directly control has remained stable for a few years now, and there are some who've suggested that the Syrian civil war has become a frozen conflict. But if Assad decided a gamble to regain Syria's control over the Golan Heights and attack the Israelis right now while they're distracted by a war in Gaza, there is the chance he would take that the various rebel forces who are still alive and well in Syria might seize upon their own opportunity and renew their offensives against him while he's distracted by the new war that he just started with Israel. And that has the possibility to completely undo the stable but fragile situation in Syria that he finally achieved achieved after a decade of war and hundreds of thousands of lives and the overwhelming support of his Russian allies. Allies who probably won't come to his help again to the same scale that they did last time because, unlike the last time, they're fighting their own colossal war of conquest in Ukraine and have other priorities to deal with. For those reasons, Bashar al-Assad himself will be very likely to keep the Syrian army from attacking the Israelis directly. And even if he was thinking about intervening, the Israelis already fired missiles at the onset of the war with Hamas breaking out, that knocked out the country's two most major airports at Damascus and Aleppo anyway, meaning that Syria wouldn't be able to fully utilize their air force to initiate an attack. But nonetheless, Syria continues to be very closely aligned with Iran and the Assad regime can still be a highly useful piece to the rest of the axis of resistance's confrontation with Israel, because they willingly offer up their geography to the safe passage of the axis's other pieces, such as two of Iran's knights. They're Shiite militias placed within Syria nearby to the Israeli-controlled Golan Heights. There is the militia called the Fatimayun, made up of around 15,000 Shiite fighters hailing from Afghanistan while the other militia is called the Zainabiyun and is made up of an additional 5,000 Shiite fighters hailing from Pakistan. Both of these militias were organized, funded, and trained by Iran's own Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, or IRGC, to fight against Bashar al-Assad's various enemies during the Syrian civil war. But now that the civil war is largely quieted down and the militias both remain near to Israel's de facto borders, they represent roughly 20,000 battle-experienced and well-armed Iranian-aligned fighters sitting around without much to do, and since they're entirely composed of Afghans and Pakistanis, Tehran might calculate that they are now an expendable force, and could serve as the next logical piece on the board to advance forward into the confrontation with Israel, especially if the situation in the West Bank devolves out of control and forces the Israeli army to redeploy some of their units there. An assault by the Fatimayun and the Zainabayun into the Golan Heights would provide the Iranian and the Syrian governments with a certain amount of plausible deniability, and it would force the Israelis to confront a new front line in the northeast, at the same time as the Houthis and Hamas continue their fighting on other fronts. But the ultimate question that has been on everyone's mind ever since Hamas first launched their attack on October 7th is what will Iran's queen on the board end up doing? Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, immediately across the border from Israel's north. You see, Hezbollah is revolutionary Iran's greatest ever success story. It was painstakingly created by the Ayatollah Khamenei and the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps during the 1980s out of Lebanon's own significant Shia Muslim population centers in the south and the east of the country, representing the first other country that Iran successfully exported their Shiite Islamic revolution into. Ever since, Hezbollah has been dedicated to driving out all American and European influence in Lebanon, defending Lebanon's Shia Muslim community, spreading Iran's Islamic revolution elsewhere in the world, and assisting Iran with destroying the state of Israel from existence. Since its founding, Hezbollah has grown into what is almost certainly the most influential and well-armed non-state actor anywhere in the world today, and is probably more influential and well-armed than many actual countries are. Their leader, Hassan Nasrallah, boasted in 2021 that the organization had 100,000 fighters at their disposal, while Western estimates believe they have at least 60,000 which is still roughly as large as the entire standing army of Lebanon itself, the country where they are based. And moreover, Hezbollah's fighters are probably better trained, more experienced, better funded, and better equipped than the Lebanese army is as well, which likely means that Hezbollah is more powerful than the Lebanese state itself is. As of 2018, the United States has estimated that the Iranians fund Hezbollah to the tune of 700 million US dollars per year, which shields Hezbollah from the financial woes of Lebanon and the weak Lebanese domestic currency. 
This funding provided by Iran places Hezbollah about on a par with the military budget of Venezuela, an entire country with nearly 29 million people. This funding and continuous military training from Iran has enabled Hezbollah to resemble something more akin to an actual professional army than a mere militia. They are believed to possess a vast arsenal of around 150,000 rockets and missiles many of which are precision-guided ballistic missiles that can strike anywhere in Israel. They possess advanced anti-air and anti-ship missile defense systems. They have advanced anti-tank weapons. They possess numerous artillery pieces. They control a fleet of aerial drones. They have a capable cyber warfare unit. And, according to U.S. intelligence, they might even possess chemical and biological weapons as well. Hezbollah is a vastly more intimidating threat to Israel than Hamas is, and it represents Iran's most high-value piece on the board to confront Israel with. Ever since the war between Israel and Hamas began, Hezbollah has declared its solidarity for Hamas and the two sides have been engaged in skirmishes and light attacks nearly every single day across Israel's northern border. Hezbollah has repeatedly fired artillery and launched missiles, drones, and occasional small ground raids targeting cities, towns, and military bases in northern Israel and in the Golan Heights. While Israel has repeatedly fired artillery and launched airstrikes on targets deemed to be a part of Hezbollah all across southern Lebanon. So far, as of this video's production since October 7th, around 100 of Hezbollah's fighters and at least 15 civilians in Lebanon have already been killed by the fighting up here, while six Israeli soldiers and three Israeli civilians have also been killed. Israel has even further ordered the total evacuation of all its civilians from along this strip of the northern border with Lebanon, which has resulted in an additional 65,000 Israelis becoming internally displaced. Out of all the front lines that are beyond the Gaza Strip, this is the one that Israel is the most concerned about escalating into a full-blown second front that it will have to deal with. So far, the fighting up here has remained limited to skirmishes, but all it might take is just a single miscalculation on either side to blow up into another full-scale war. If that happens, Israel will not only face the awful prospect of having to fight a two-front war, and possibly a third front in the Golan Heights, a fourth front in the West Bank, and a fifth front from the Houthis down in the far south, but they will also face the fact that Hezbollah can damage Israel to a significantly higher degree than Hamas did during their attack on October 7th. Were Hezbollah to unleash their entire arsenal of 150,000 rockets and missiles upon Israel all at once, it would almost certainly overwhelm Israel's missile defense systems. And in addition to targeting Israel's population centers and military facilities, Hezbollah's more advanced guided missiles can be used to specifically target Israel's most critical infrastructure and turn the country's geography against it. Consider Israel's water security. Because a large amount of Israel consists of desert and is frequently subjected to droughts, the country is overall one of the most arid in the world, with scant amounts of rainfall and very limited naturally occurring sources of fresh water. Because of this, Israel has long been one of the world's leading pioneers in water desalination technology, the process of transforming salt water into drinkable fresh water. Today, a collection of only five desalination plants on the Israeli Mediterranean coast provide about 80% of Israel's entire supply of drinkable water. On the one hand, these plants represent a technological marvel that has enabled the Israelis to overcome the problem of their naturally arid geography. But, on the other hand, the plants also burden Israel with a brand new geographic problem to be highly concerned about. If Hezbollah decides to concentrate large numbers of their guided missiles on just these five desalination plants, they stand to potentially catastrophically cripple Israel's entire drinkable water supply. And that's far from the only geographic vulnerability of Israel's that they can use their missiles to exploit. When it comes to energy security, Israel has long been a very fragile place as well. The former Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir once famously quipped that the Jews had come to settle the only place in the entire Middle East where there wasn't any oil. And so, until as late as 2003, Israel had no other choice than to import more than 96% of all the energy that it consumed primarily in the form of imported oil and coal. But Israel's energy security problem finally started turning around in the late 2000s, when a series of big natural gas discoveries started suddenly being made in the eastern Mediterranean, right off of their own shoreline. 
In 2009 and 2010, a small American energy company based out of Houston called Noble discovered the massive Tamar and Leviathan gas fields within Israel's economic waters. Several smaller gas fields would be discovered in the years that have followed to the point where it is now believed that Israel possesses nearly 1,100 cubic kilometers worth of natural gas reserves. Meaning that in only the span of a decade and a half, the country went from being completely insignificant in the global gas industry to having one of the top 25 largest reserves of gas in the world. Offshore drilling platforms were constructed, and by 2019, Israel was producing from both the Tamar and the Leviathan natural gas fields. And for the very first time, Israel was actually producing more natural gas than they were consuming. By the start of this decade in the 2020s, that fact enabled Israel to start doing two things that it had never been capable of doing before. First, it enabled the Israelis to become significantly more energy independent and less reliant on imports coming in from abroad. Israel's own natural gas supplies currently power more than 70% of the country's electricity. While Israel's domestically produced solar energy from solar farms across the southern Negev desert is expected to grow enough in the future to fully encompass the remaining 30% of Israeli's electricity supply by the end of the decade in 2030. Meaning that by that time, Israel will no longer have to rely on imports from anywhere to keep their electricity going. And second, Israel's production of natural gas rapidly beginning to exceed their own demands for it opened the door in the 2020s to Israel becoming a significant natural gas exporter as well. Israel already exports fairly substantial amounts of gas via pipelines to neighboring Egypt and Jordan, and there are further proposals in the works to construct a new 6 billion euro subsea pipeline from Israel to Cyprus to Greece to Italy that will open the door to Israel becoming a major natural gas supplier to the European Union as well. While expected to liquefy natural gas processing facilities constructed around Israel's west coast, will open up the possibility of Israel exporting its gas to anyone in the world who wants it. Israel's publicly stated ambitions are now to achieve a natural gas export capacity of 25 to 30 cubic kilometers per year by the end of the decade in 2030. An ambition that, if achieved, will skyrocket Israel from zero natural gas exports as recently as 2010 to one of the top 15 natural gas exporters in the entire world only 20 years later. And over these past few years that Israel's natural gas has given the country newfound capabilities and powers, Hezbollah has watched on from their vantage point in southern Lebanon. Today, if they chose to, Hezbollah's precision-guided ballistic and cruise missiles could be fired to strike Israel's offshore gas platforms at both the Tamar and Leviathan fields, and if they were successful in destroying them, 70% of Israel's electricity supply would be wiped offline in an instant, while Israel's ability to continue exporting gas would be crippled as well. Even further, additional Hezbollah missile strikes in and around Israel's most major ports on the Mediterranean, Haifa, Ashdod, and Ashkelon, combined with continued Houthi missiles attacks against Israel's southernmost port in Eilat could serve to effectively blockade Israel too. Even though Israel has become largely self-sufficient when it comes to its electricity supply, Israel still relies very heavily on imports for its food supply and overwhelmingly for its oil supply. Israel imports virtually the entirety of its oil from abroad through tankers coming in by sea. And the country only has three oil import terminals they can bring supplies in through, at Haifa, Ashkelon, and Eilat. When considering that most major oil-producing countries around Israel and the Middle East don't recognize Israel's existence and refuse to trade their oil with them, the country currently imports 60% of their oil supply from just two post-Soviet states instead, Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan. Kazakhstan's oil is transported to Israel via pipelines to the Russian Black Sea port of Novorossiysk, and then by tankers across the sea to Ashkelon and Haifa, while Azerbaijan's oil is similarly transported via pipeline to the Turkish port of Sehan, and then transported by tankers across the sea to Haifa and Ashkelon as well. While the vast majority of Israel's remaining oil supply comes from various West African countries by tanker ships to Ashkelon and Haifa too. Eilat can be used to import oil into Israel through the Red Sea as well, but it hasn't been used for this purpose since 2020, since Haifa and Ashkelon have the much larger terminals. But all ships conducting trade like this require maritime insurance to continue doing business. And when wars break out around ports and the risk of ships trying to enter those ports getting attacked by missiles or pirates increases, insurance companies begin demanding a higher wartime premium to compensate for the risk. Israel's ports were already some of the most expensive in the entire world for maritime insurance companies to cover before the war with Hamas even began. And now they're considered the third most expensive in the world 
only behind Russia's and Ukraine's ports on the Black Sea, and the two major Yemeni ports that are under the control of the Houthis. So, were Hezbollah to fully enter into the war and begin bombarding Israel's offshore gas platforms and Israel's ports with missiles, it stands that Israel's already sky-high maritime insurance rates will skyrocket even further, and that may drive a lot of shipping companies into simply refusing to continue doing business at Israeli ports. Which could complicate Israel's imported supplies of oil and food, at the same time as Israel's electricity supply and natural gas exports would be threatened as well. Put all together, Hezbollah's full-scale entry into the war with Israel would open up a major second military front for Israel to have to deal with in the north of the country, while Hezbollah's massive arsenal of rockets and missiles could directly threaten Israel's drinking water supply, Israel's electricity supply, Israel's imported oil and food supplies, and Israel's exports of natural gas. To say nothing of the potential additional fronts that could open up in the Golan Heights, the West Bank, and to the south in the Red Sea. Which is all obviously something that Israel doesn't want to have to deal with, and something that the United States doesn't want to deal with enough to have placed an entire carrier strike group off of Lebanon's coast in the eastern Mediterranean, as a direct threat to Hezbollah not to make any big moves. And the other carrier strike group that they positioned near to the Strait of Hormuz off of Iran's southern coast. But as Iran's queen, Hezbollah is the piece on the board that most often keeps the Israelis in check from the perspective of Tehran. Hezbollah's ability to rain down apocalyptic destruction on Israel serves as a massive deterrent to Israel from launching airstrikes against Iran's own nuclear weapons development sites. If Israel initiated airstrikes to destroy Iran's nuclear weapons sites, then Iran could order Hezbollah to retaliate with their arsenal of 150,000 rockets and missiles against Israel. And that is how Iran is able to ensure at least some level of mutually assured destruction with Tel Aviv, and how they prevent the Israelis from attacking their nuclear weapon sites. So, if Iran decided to fully commit Hezbollah into the attack on Israel now in support of Hamas and Gaza, Hezbollah's supply of rockets and missiles would likely be mostly used up, while Hezbollah could also become severely weakened or even destroyed in the process, especially when considering the likely intervention of the American Navy that's right nearby. That could end up becoming a fatal mistake that would remove Iran's queen from the board, place Israel out of check, expose Iran's nuclear weapons sites directly to the Israeli Air Force, and destroy decades worth of efforts that Iran has spent carefully positioning Hezbollah to where it is today. And then, once again from Iran's perspective, Israel's capabilities to the west of them are far from their only looming threat that's currently around them. There is also Azerbaijan to their north, who maintains very close relations with Israel due to a variety of strategically aligned factors. The foundation of their relationship, however, is their mutual opposition to the influence of Iran. Ever since Azerbaijan's independence from the Soviet Union back in the 1990s, Tehran has been fearful of Azerbaijan's ultimate intentions regarding this area of northwestern Iran that is known as Iranian Azerbaijan. That is because around 17 million ethnic Azerbaijanis live within this area of northwestern Iran today, more than the population of Azerbaijan itself. And so, Iran has been fearful that one day, Azerbaijan might begin to lay claim to the territory. This isn't helped in Tehran's mind by the fact that Azerbaijan buys most of their military's weapons from Israel, the alleged presence of the Israeli Mossad in Azerbaijan, the alleged airfield access that Azerbaijan grants to the Israeli Air Force, so that they have a much more forward base to launch from to attack Iran's nuclear weapon sites, and Azerbaijan's recent significant military victories against Armenia. On the 19th of September, nearly weeks before Hamas launched their attack on Israel, the Azerbaijanis launched a renewed military offensive against Armenia that resulted in a few segments of Armenia proper coming under Azerbaijani military occupation, and Azerbaijan's final victory over the self-declared Republic of Artsakh in the Nagorno-Karabakh region, an internationally recognized part of Azerbaijan that was populated in de facto governed by ethnic Armenians who wish to secede from the country. 120,000 Armenians used to live within Nagorno-Karabakh, but Azerbaijan's sudden victory in September resulted in virtually all of them fleeing the region in a panicked mass exodus towards Armenia proper within only a matter of weeks. And Azerbaijan is probably still not finished. In the next phase of Azerbaijan's ambitions, the country appears increasingly likely to invade and occupy Armenia's southernmost province of Sunik, which will connect Azerbaijan proper with their currently disconnected and landlocked exclave of Nakaivan, a part of Azerbaijan that shares a very narrow border with Turkey. 
were Azerbaijan to successfully conquer Armenia's Sunik province. The possibility could suddenly then arise of establishing continuous rail, oil, and gas pipeline routes from Azerbaijan's capital Baku directly to Istanbul and to Europe, while Iran's entire northern frontier directly opposite of their own 17 million ethnic Azerbaijanis would be dominated by a Turkish-Azerbaijani alliance. And Azerbaijan's next focus may then turn towards the south from there, potentially with Israeli assistance and with Turkish and NATO assistance. This would obviously be a complete geopolitical disaster for the Iranians. And it's why Iran chooses to so heavily support Armenia against Azerbaijan. Because, as it stands now, Armenia's Sunik province is the only thing that separates Azerbaijan's core from Turkey. And Iran would like to keep things that way. It's why Iran has even gone so far as to threaten war with Azerbaijan if they were to invade Armenia's Sunik province next. And thus, if Iran ordered Hezbollah into the war with Israel right now, and then the United States intervened by attacking Hezbollah in Lebanon and Iran's maritime trade in the Persian Gulf, Azerbaijan could then reasonably calculate that with Iran busy elsewhere and with Russia still busy in Ukraine, then would be the perfect opportunity to launch their own invasion of Armenia's Sunik province largely unopposed. And then Iran would face a much worse in geopolitical environment to their north as well. And thus, Iran has to carefully balance where and how they move their pieces all around the board, as the movement of the Houthis in Yemen or Hezbollah in Lebanon could end up creating unpredictable power vacuums elsewhere, like in the southern Caucasus, and within Iran itself that Iran has to be wary of exposing. They don't want to encourage Azerbaijan to attack Armenia or to expose their nuclear weapon sites to retaliatory attacks. So, Iran probably has a lot of misgivings about throwing Hezbollah into the war with Israel right now. And they may already be perfectly content with the fact that Hamas's war with Israel has already achieved many of Iran's own objectives. The normalization agreement between Israel and Saudi Arabia has likely been wrecked for the foreseeable future. While additional Muslim countries like Turkey, Jordan, and Bahrain have withdrawn their ambassadors to Israel because of the war, and more may end up following suit. America's proposed India-Middle East-Europe economic corridor is now in jeopardy. The Saudis aren't increasing their oil production, so oil prices will continue remaining high, while possible humanitarian catastrophes continue to loom in the future for all of Iran's enemies to deal with. If large numbers of Palestinians are eventually pushed out from the Gaza Strip into Egypt, or from the West Bank into Jordan and Saudi Arabia. Iran may already be content with these outcomes, and is more focused on its own survival right now rather than risking a Middle East-wide war before it is ready to launch one. Perhaps the Iranians would rather wait to confront Israel more directly when they have actually acquired nuclear weapons, and while the United States is possibly more distracted elsewhere with a war with China over the fate of Taiwan. And moreover, Lebanon itself, where Hezbollah is based, probably has a lot of misgivings about Hezbollah dragging the entire country into a war right now as well. Israel has repeatedly threatened that if Hezbollah escalates the skirmishes still going on in the north into a full-scale war, Israel will massively retaliate in Lebanon and destroy Hezbollah alongside Hamas. Israeli and likely American fighters, bombers, and missiles would likely pound Lebanon while Israeli troops might even expand a ground invasion into Lebanon again, just like they have done before in the past, which will likely tip Lebanon over the brink into the status of being a fully-fledged failed state. Lebanon is a country that has been tremendously struggling just to stay together since 2019, when the country started to become embroiled in what has been described as one of the worst financial depressions anywhere in the world since the 19th century. Just since 2019, the Lebanese currency has been devalued by more than 90%. In 2022, the inflation rate in Lebanon began reaching more than 170% while the country's debt-to-GDP ratio climbed to more than 151%, one of the highest debt ratios of any country in the world. Public services in Lebanon have already largely collapsed, and Lebanese households without their own private generator can only expect about an hour or so of power a day from the grid. There are already drinking water shortages in the country, and cholera cases have been reported in Lebanon for the first time in decades. And this has all been without the country even being at war. If Hezbollah commits to war with Israel now, it likely means that Israeli and American retaliatory attacks on Hezbollah within Lebanon will cause Lebanon to break and completely collapse as a state, potentially throwing the country back into a chaotic civil war again like during the 1980s. And in addition to being a fighting force, Hezbollah is a major governing political party within Lebanon too. And that means that while they ultimately take their orders from Iran, they are also still liable to the Lebanese people as well. And the Lebanese people fundamentally do not want an all-out war with Israel right now. 
Nonetheless, as Hezbollah and Israel continue to fire artillery and rockets at each other in small volumes across the border, and people on both sides keep getting killed, and as the war in Gaza continues dragging on, there is plenty of space for a terrible miscalculation on either side to be made that leads to a full-scale war anyway. The last time that such a miscalculation led to a war between them happened fairly recently, in 2006, when a small-scale Hezbollah raid across the border escalated all the way into a full-blown war that lasted for an entire month and saw the Israeli Defense Forces launching a full-scale ground invasion into southern Lebanon and the Israeli Air Force and Navy initiating air and sea blockades over the entire country. Of course, there's a lot more history and context to the many, many wars that have been fought between Israel and Lebanon that eventually led up to the current fighting that's going on today. The current skirmishes between Israel and Hezbollah is the deadliest round of fighting between them that has happened since the 2006 war. But the conflict between them goes back much further than 2006. Between 1975 and 1990, Lebanon was completely consumed by a catastrophic civil war fought amongst its extremely religiously diverse population. That civil war saw an Israeli invasion of Lebanon, the Israeli occupation of southern Lebanon that lasted until the year 2000, and the original rise of Hezbollah to its current position of power. It's all extremely important context to know about in order to fully understand what's going on here right now. But unfortunately, due to the inherently violent, controversial, and recent nature of discussing how an organization widely considered to be terrorists like Hezbollah managed to catapult themselves into their current position of power in Lebanon, and how the actual fighting between Hezbollah and Israel has gone ever since, the next part of this video would almost certainly cause the rest of the video before it to become age-restricted and demonetized, which ultimately would mean that YouTube's algorithm wouldn't have ever promoted any of this video to you, and you probably never would have seen any of it. But thankfully, I was still able to produce the next part of this video anyway because of the power of this video's sponsor, Nebula, where you can go and watch the next full-length video covering exactly how Hezbollah managed to rise to power in Lebanon, and how the many wars and conflicts between Hezbollah and the Israelis have been fought ever since. If you want a broader context behind the conflict that's happening today with information that this video didn't get into, like what happened during the Lebanese Civil War, why Israel decided to invade Lebanon in the 1980s, and occupy parts of it until 2000, how Hezbollah was created, and how the conflict between Israel and Hezbollah has evolved over the years that have followed, then this is what you should check out next right now, as it's all very important to understand if you want to try and make sense of what's going on here today. And this is also just one of more than dozens of exclusive, full-length real-life lore videos that you can only find on Nebula in my overall Modern Conflict series there, that can all only be found over there because of all of their darker, more controversial subject material. There are other full-length episodes you can go and watch covering how other recent major conflicts in the Middle East began and went that this video also never really got into, like this hour-long dive into the history of the Israel-Hamas conflict, two episodes detailing the rise and fall of ISIS across Iraq and Syria, multiple episodes episodes covering the civil wars that have happened in Syria, Yemen, and Libya, the complicated conflict between the Turkish government and the Kurds, a deep dive into the history of the US-Iran conflict, and many, many more, with new episodes releasing every single month that will help you understand the complicated geopolitics of the Middle East and the world in general. And what's even more, you also get access to all of the other amazing exclusive content that's on Nebula as well. Because the best part about this site is that it's jointly co-owned by all of its creators, built by myself and hundreds of other independent YouTubers and podcasters. And because it's a subscription-based service, we all get to work on way bigger and higher budget productions over there than we could ever do on our own on YouTube. That's why there's tons of other exclusive content on Nebula that you'll find equally fascinating from tons of other creators that you probably already know as well, like the Logistics FX series from Wendover Productions, the China Actually series from Polymatter, the Underexposure series from Neo, and tons of others. The absolute best way to support creators like all of us directly is by getting a membership to Nebula. And this month only, Nebula is doing something that's extremely wild. Only until the end of the month, Nebula is offering a lifetime membership. Instead of a recurring monthly or annual payment, it's a one-time payment that will get you everything that Nebula will ever offer forever, no strings attached. The money that we earn from these lifetime membership sales goes directly to supporting what I'm doing there and everybody else as well so that we can all make even more spectacular original content going into 2024. And we're all in it for the long haul. 
Selling lifetime memberships enables Nebula to not have to take on any outside investors to keep growing, which means that we can produce bigger and better projects without having to worry about losing any potential creative control or gaining censorship that could come from accepting outside venture capital investors instead. Lifetime memberships to Nebula are therefore being offered only this month for a one-time payment of $300, and that's it forever. And if that's not really up to your speed, that's completely fine as well. Because you can still get a 40% discount on yearly subscriptions that only comes out to about two and a half dollars a month by clicking the button that's here on your screen right now or by following the link that's down below in the description. Whichever plan you do decide to go with, whether it's lifetime, annual, or monthly, a portion of your subscription will go directly back to me and my team to help us continue producing these extremely time-consuming and expensive journalistic videos. So thank you for your consideration. I will see some of you over on Nebula next. And as always, thank you so much for watching.